Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Here you go. So it's always a privilege to stand in front of you. And uh, currently, I'm uh, anxious in some ways, but this is a good sign that I need to humble myself and let the Lord speak to all of you. Amen? Amen. Oh, Amen. So please uh, open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse, uh, starting with verse 12 today. Acts, chapter 5, verse 12. And if you're new here, uh, if you're new at this church, we are continuing a series in the book of Acts. We are going to walk through every chapter of the book, and I hope and I pray that the series that we are doing at this church is helping you to ignite your heart, ignite your love for evangelism, because this is what we need in our community. So today, we're going to discuss the unstoppable gospel, the unstoppable gospel. And uh, before we go, uh, let's, let's ask the Lord by prayer. Lord, uh, thank you for the time that you've given us. Thank you for the privilege to be here today. I pray, Lord, that your name will be glorified. I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be captivated, Lord, by the truths that is revealed by your, in the scriptures. I pray, Lord, that, you're, that, we will, that you open our hearts, Lord, and open our minds, Lord, and the truth that is revealed in your scriptures. And I pray, Lord, that we will follow this one, Lord, as we hear this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Today that we're going to discuss the unstoppable gospel. And the first thing that I want to share to all of you is this, that the gospel will thrive and endure in spite of opposition. Amen? So before we go to the text, I want to do a recap because we've been walking through this particular chapter for many weeks now. So on the first part of the book of Acts, we see that Jesus ascended to heaven. Right? And he gave mandate or a commission to all of his disciples. He said that, hey, disciples, I need you to share the gospel to Jerusalem, to Samaria, and to other parts of the world. And when Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit came and empowered the disciples to share and perform signs and wonders. And the purpose of this signs and wonders is able to testify, to validate that the message of Christ it's true that he indeed, the Messiah that they are waiting for, and because of the continuous sharing of the, world, uh, the word, many disciples or many people around Jerusalem was being converted, was able to listen to the word of God, and believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And as the time goes by, there's a lot of religious groups that persecuted the disciples. On the previous chapters, we can see that Peter and John were detained by the religious leaders and say, stop preaching the name of Jesus. However, you know, they prayed, instead of being fearful, they prayed to the Lord for boldness. And last week, we have discussed what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. And today, it's going to be a continuation on how the Lord moves in the life of the church. In verse 12, we can read, now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hand of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. This is the section of the temple where they gathered. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on the cots and mats, that as Peter came, by at least his shadows might fall on some of them. And the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And something of the, some of the things that I observe here is this. The disciple continues to perform the signs and wonders. They continue to testify that the power that they receive came from Jesus. And there are Per, uh, they're gathering in the section of the temple where in the previous chapter we can see that a lot of the people were hearing the message. But in spite of that one, you can read on, verse, on the next verse that there is some crowd, a small group of people that none or doesn't want to join them. They just see the people, this particular group of Christians, performing the acts, the miracles, and say, that is good. You know, that is so good that they're helping the people. However, there is something that stops them. You can read here that none of them were there to join them 
but the people held them in high esteem. And there are two reasons why the people you know, don't want to join them. First, on what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. On the previous verses, we can read that there's a great fear that went to the church and outside the church because Ananias and Sapphira dare to go against God. What happened is this. They consider God's work as just ordinary thing. And God showed them that, hey, you need to consider things, these things holy. And the second thing is the persecution of the leaders of the church, right? On the previous chapters, we can see that Peter and John were arrested. And some of the people were saying, those are good things. But one thing that hinders them is fear. Fear. They are fearful that they, that was, those are good, but the moment that they want to join them, it will give them some fear, and they don't like it. However, nevertheless, in verse 14, we can see that those fear, that particular fear factor that they're experiencing doesn't stop the church to grow. And the, the language that look put here is more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. It means that the fear that they're experiencing, that the other people are experiencing, the true Christians at that time said, we understand what is going on, but still we will believe on Jesus. And I love the, the detail that Luke gave here. He specified that the church had grown more than ever and proved that fear cannot stop God saving people on their area. In verse 4, it said, more than ever believers were added to the Lord, and look at the language, multitude of both men and women. This echoes the prophecy of prophet Joel and said, when he said that the Lord will put his spirit to both men and women. And this one, and it shows, indicating that the, the church is composed of diversity, both men and women and women. And as we look at the verses, you can see that the people will continue to bring the sick people, the people with ailments to the apostles, to perf so that they will see that the Lord is going to move in their life. Just imagine the people there to the point that they will carry the sick outside of the streets. Just imagine here for a moment that we are full crowded here today, a lot of people are attending Brickshaw Baptist Church, and they're so amazed on what the Lord is doing in our church that there are people outside of the parking lot waiting for Pastor Ray performing some miracles or performing what the Lord is doing. And we should uh, be aware that the apostolic signs are given to the apostles only as a foundation, to lay the foundation for the church, to give a testimony that the Lord is moving on their life. And as the apostles continue to perform signs and wonders, we can say that the gospel ministry also attracts people from other places. You can see on this one, the people are also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem. The preaching of the word is not only for the Jerusalem. They're also attracting people. They hear the message of, the, of Christ. And when we apply this one in our lives, here in Columbus, Ohio, there's a lot of people who need the gospel. Pastor Ray always mentioned the nations came to us in Columbus. I read the statistics last time that Columbus is one of the fastest growing city in the Midwest and in America. And the city is booming. And this is an opportunity for us, church, to share the gospel of Christ, to share them the love of Christ to them, especially on this particular time and age. And as the church, this should be an encouragement. This should be an encouragement to us. However, however, whenever the Lord's work is being flour is flourishing, whenever the work of God is expanding, the enemy continues to stop what the Lord is doing in the community. And on this particular verse, you can see that the high priest, on verse 17, I'll, I'll read this one, but the high priest it's either Annas or Caiaphas at that time, rose up. All who were with him, that is the part of the Sadducees. Those are the people who were the same people who arrested 
and order Jesus to be killed are filled with jealousy. They're jealous about what the Lord is doing to the apostles. So what they did is this, verse 18, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. Public prison. So for, for them, they thought the gospel would stop when the apostles were in prison. However, verse 19, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all of the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. The high priests and the Sadducees, those are the characters that we have read and seen for the previous chapter. Those are the people that who wants to hinder, to stop the work of God. They're the same people who detained Peter and John. On previous chapter, they just detained the apostles temporarily. They just said like, hey, I want you to stop preaching. I want you guys to shut up. And what did the Lord, what did the apostles did? Did they follow what the high priest said? No. They asked for boldness. And what we are hearing or what we are reading here is the result of God giving the boldness that they need. So what so now they have, the high priests have the justification to arrest them. So they put them in public prison. They want them to shut up permanently. They want to stop the gospel work permanently. But they, they think that's the end of this. But the Lord moves. The Lord is always wants to move forward. And what he did, he sent an angel. And the funny thing is this, the Sadducees, the same people who doesn't, who arrested Jesus doesn't believe in supernatural. They don't believe in resurrection. They don't believe in angelic being like this. So there's a humor on this one. But the reason why God sent the angel is to testify that the work of God cannot be stopped, that the work of God should continue in spite of the opposition that was laid. The first opposition is fear. The second opposition is the public prison. They thought that they could contain the work of God in a physical confinement. They thought that being in a prison is the end of this. But the Lord said, nope, it is not. He used supernatural means to, to free the apostles. To free the apostles. And we can see this one as we elaborate on this one. Maybe this time they will not preach anymore. They went to prison. Maybe this time they will shut up because they experienced this being detained or being sentenced permanently. But God sent his angel to free the apostles to testify that God's work should continue nevertheless. And look at the words that the angel gave them. It said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people. Go means move forward. Move forward. We have something to say. Stand in the temple to be firm, to be bold on what the message is and speak and preach the word of life. This is the first time that the gospel this is the first time that the gospel of Jesus Christ is referenced as the word of life. And let me ask you, what do you think what kind of life that the angel is talking about? Is this the life that is full of money? Is this a life of full of success? But as we read the scriptures, the life that they're talking about is more than those worldly things. The life that they're offering is the life that they can receive and obtain through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus died for our sins so that we could have eternal life. And that's the thing. Indeed, Jesus is an offering a new life. And those who will receive the message will receive a life of forgiveness, a life of hope, and a better future. A better future. This is not just a life that is richness in this world. This is a life that is with the presence of God. In verse 21, we can read, when they hear this, they entered the temple at the daybreak 
and began to teach. And like the disciples, church, Brickshaw Baptist Church, we are instructed by the Lord to preach the word, to go, to stand firm on our convictions that the life that God is offering is a life of forgiveness, and that we, if we believe on Him, we will find the life in the presence of the Lord. And in spite of the oppositions that we face, God will move because the goal that we have is to share it to the ends of the world. I was reading some articles online about the information about some of the churches here in the pre recent years. We can read, I read that in North Korea, Open Door, uh, an organization estimated that there's 400,000 Christians in spite the government wants to suppress Christianity. We know in China, there's a lot of people, millions of Christians in the underground church serving the Lord in spite of the suppression of the government because of communism. There's, and the fast, and I was surprised in this one, the fastest growing church is not found in North America. It is in a Middle East country called Iran. In Iran. And I was reading this one, I was surprised. They are the most, one of the most Islamic countries that they have a very strict policy about religious freedom. And yet, they're the fastest growing church. And this testifies what we are saying here, that in spite of the opposition, in spite of different obstacles, the Lord's work will continue. And do you know what's the saddest thing? The same statistics shows me that there's a decline in the church here in the United States. It's very sad. We should use our freedom to share the word of God because there's a lot of people who need Jesus Christ our Lord in the streets, in the city, in the different parts of the country. And as we continue with the verse, we can see and we can read that the high priest and his associates and the people that wants to persecute these apostles, they called a meeting. They called the council to determine what will be the future of these disciples. What, will, what is the right thing to do for them? Because they, you know, these particular people are, are, you know, being an obstacle to what their agenda is. But the funny thing is this, they sent the temple officer, the officer to get the people. However, they didn't see the apostles. They said that the, that the priests and cell were locked, but the apostles were not there. So they're, I believe they're scratching their head like, where is this people? You know, there's no, is this an inside job or what? But they see that the prison doors were locked. And there was a one person who reported, are you looking for this, guys? They're in the temple preaching again. They're preaching again. So I was wondering, what is going on in this, right? So, so they reported back to the, to the high priest, and the high priest said, hey, can you bring them back here? So at this time, there's no violence. They just arrested them in a very quiet manner because they are afraid of what the people are saying to them. While the disciples were boldly preaching the, preaching the gospel, this particular temple officers or the people were afraid on what the people would say to them. Throughout the book of Acts, we can read the, the theme of the fear of man is always coming up the fear of man. And you can see the agenda and the heart of, the, of the, the religious leaders. They always want the applause of the people. So on verse 27, we can read. On verse 27, when they had brought them back, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet you are here filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man, man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles said, We must obey God rather than man. God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on the tree. God extolled him at the right hand as a leader and a savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are witnesses to these things. 
and so is the Holy Spirit on whom God has given to those who obey Him. This religious leaders be like, you again? Are you preaching again? We tried to, sh- to silence you. We told you to shut up, but you're still preaching the name again. And what did the apostles said? We must, the word must is important there. They are obligated. That is the duty that they have. We must obey God than you, you guys. You high priests and Sadducees say that we need to shut up. You imprison us. But God freed us physically so that we can free people spiritually. We, God free us from our prison to share the word continuously by those evidences, by we witnessing that the angel opened the prison doors. We must obey God than you guys. They recognize that there is a no neutral ground in this. There is no middle ground. It's either you're going to obey God or you're going to obey the, the, what the world is saying. It's either you're going to say or going to follow the culture or are you going to follow what the scriptures is saying. We must stand on the conviction that we have that the Lord and the authority that God has given us to preach the gospel, when he saved us, he will sustain us too. Amen? There was a, Jesus said this one in the gospels, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters, which reminds me of a one person in history that is a good example for this one. Some of the best lines in history was uttered or were uttered by the people who stand for God. During the 16th century, when the word of God is being corrupted, when the word of God is being played upon by other religious leaders, there was a German priest named Martin Luther. Do any one of you know Martin Luther? Martin Luther is a, is a, a Roman Catholic priest at that time. And he was bothered on what the institution is doing with the Word of God. And Martin Luther defended the biblical teaching. At one point, he was asked by religious leaders to say, to recant what you're saying, to renounce one of the things that you've written. And I'm going to, uh, to say what he said on that particular trial. And because this is so good. He said, unless I was convinced by the testimony of the scriptures, and by the clear reason, I am bound by the scriptures that I have quoted. My conscience is captive by the word of God. I cannot, I cannot, and I will not retract anything since it is not safe for me to go against my conscience. And here this is. Here I stand. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise God, help me. Amen. Those are the exact words that Martin Luther said. When the pressure of those religious leaders at that time said, you need to obey us, Martin Luther said, no, I am going to stand on what the Lord is saying on the scriptures. On the scriptures. Do you know why? Because the truth that we need is revealed in the scriptures. For we are saved by grace alone. Through the, through the death of Jesus, by Christ alone, that is revealed on scriptures alone. And all of those is for the glory of God and God alone. And church, we are called, like the apostles, like Martin Luther, we are bound on what the Lord is saying on the scriptures. We cannot be silent on this. And if you recognize how the people at that time react on what they said, you know, they're going to be mad about it. But it's always about what the Lord is saying. Especially now, on our time, the cancel culture is there. All of, all, you know, you just say a little thing and people will cancel you. And there's a, a pressure on our side that we need to soften up some of our language. That we need to compromise just a little bit. You know, and those compromises doesn't show a big time. 
It's just maybe changing some words. That Jesus is the Savior is going to Jesus is a Savior. When the exclusivity of Christ that we hold became just an option for all of the people. And those are the things that we need to be thinking about. How is your Christian life today? And some of the people were persecuted on that one. But I want to give another thing here too. There's a fine line between being saying the truth and being rude and being a bad Christian on their testimony. There are some people who are, as a Christian, we are persecuted on our, on our belief, which is good, which is true. However, there are some Christians who demonstrate an Christ's attitude. And people are, and they're saying, I'm persecuted of, of my belief. And I'm going to tell them, no, you're just being a jerk. That's it. You know, like, instead of showing the love of Christ, people are turning away to Christ because of their attitude. Being a Christian, we need to stand on the truth, but we should not, we should remember always that we should say the truth with love. We should say the truth with love. We should see that people with with a compassionate heart. Jesus said, things that are truthful, but he still demonstrate compassionate, compassionate attitude towards them. And that is something that we should not forget. We, we tend to become zealous without, for, with, uh, without thinking, am I demonstrating Christ-like attitude? We should always remember that. And the next thing that the apostle said, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on the tree. God exalted him at the right hand as a leader or a savior. The leader here can translate it as a prince. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. The work, you can see this one, the work of our salvation. The message, the gospel message. You can see there's a Trinitarian harmony between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father raised Jesus from the grave. God planned our salvation. God the Son, Jesus, was exalted. Jesus purchased our salvation when he died on the cross. And the Holy Spirit, he was said here, was given to those who obey him. The Holy Spirit is given to us to apply the salvation to us for we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors of Christ. But maybe you're asking, why do these particular religious leaders are so against about the preaching? As you can see, the issue is not about performing miracles. It's not about performing miracles. It's not about gathering in the temple. The issue that they have is preaching Christ. What is something about Christ? Because the message of the apostle contains the truth that they deny. They deny that Jesus is Messiah. They deny it because they don't believe in resurrection. They deny that he's the one that God saved, sent to save them. They still deny it. But the most thing is this. The apostle said, you guys are the one who killed the Messiah. And they don't like that truth. They deny it. And on, verse, on, on the previous chapter, they said, the miracles and the signs and wonders, they cannot deny it. They cannot explain it. However, the truth, you know, they're afraid to face it because of their power. The association of Jesus with the title of prince as a leader could ignite the hopes of a Jewish rebellion. That's on their mind. That maybe this particular group that is gathering in the temple could ignite a Jewish rebellion that could overthrow us, could remove the power that they have as something that associated with the Roman Empire. As we look at the intention of this one, it boils down on this. The Jesus message of freedom and new life conflicts with their selfish agenda of power. That's it. 
They want to be in the top. They want to control the people. They want to, they're the one who manage the temple. They're the one who being mediator between the Roman Empire and the Jewish people. And they don't like this new life. They give a new hope. They don't like it. The offense is not about the gathering. It's about Jesus clashing with their selfish agenda. And as we look at our lives today, how many times have we seen ourselves when Jesus tells something about your life? We try to clash with that. We try to struggle. Lord, is this something that you really want from me? Sometimes we struggle. We bargain with God, right? On the conference that we uh, attended this, uh, this weekend, I love what, he, what the, one of the speakers said, that you know, we, ta- we tend to give God 10% of our life. We thought that our life is just like a tithe, just a 10%. But the rest of the 90%, Lord, it is my life. But we forget as Christians that we are bought by Jesus Christ. That the life that you are having right now is given by God. And when we understand the grace of God in our life, we tend to appreciate what the Lord gave to us. All of the good things that you've got in your life is from God for his glory. And when we see our life on that particular perspective, that the purpose of our life is to give glory to God, I think we will change in how we live our lives. Amen? Amen. So now it set the stage. There's a confrontation between the uh, the, the Sadducees and the apostles. The apostles stand and stood their ground. They said, we are going to obey the Lord than you guys. And they said, it is you guys who killed Jesus. But in spite of that one, God and Jesus offering you forgiveness and freedom. And look at this one, which leads us to our second point. No opposition can prevail against us when we align ourselves with God's purpose. We can read that one in verse 33 and onwards. When they hear this, They were enraged. They want to kill those people. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave order to put the men outside for a while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care of what you're about to do with this man. For those days, there's some rebellious people. And he mentioned two people, the Judas and Judas. They, he said, they incited a rebellion at that time. They rose up, but they failed. They failed. But on verse 39, he said, uh, verse 38, in the present case, I tell you, keep away from this man. Let them alone. For if this plan or, or this undertaking of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. Few observation in this particular verses that in spite of this confrontation on this scenario, the providential care of God is there for his disciples. We were introduced to a character named Gamaliel. For many of you, maybe you hear this name as you read your scriptures, the Bible. He is the teacher of the Apostle Paul. He's one of the greatest teachers of the law at that time. And people, you know, like have a high respect on him. People adore him. People will listen to what he's going to say because he knows what he's talking about. This particular guy is not just a random teacher. He is the teacher of the law. And just imagine you're being, there's a confrontation between the Sadducees and the Apostles. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, you know, this like, un- you will receive a rescue from an unlikely character. Just imagine a Pharisee, right? We tend to see a Pharisee on the scriptures as the enemy of the word, you know, like those are the same people who despise Jesus. But at this time, he's the same, a Pharisee stood up for the apostle and say, hey, get up, stop, stop. 
Just be careful in what you're going to do. And then he provided some examples here. He provided two pseudos messiahs or fake saviors, to, uh, to Judas and Judas. There's a limited information on, on, whole, uh, on those people. I researched about this one, and most of the things that I've gathered is they incited a rebellion against the Roman Empire. They want to free the Jewish people from those people, from taxation, from owning their own government. Those are the, the mission of those people. They gathered their followers, you know, empowering them with those, uh, you know, the lovely and charismatic words, and they, he, they got their followers, but they failed, and they failed. And Gamaliel is suggesting, like, just stop for a moment. Think about this. You guys are being captivated by your emotions. Well, Gamaliel uses common sense, you know? Just imagine, I am not sure if the apostles shared the angelic uh, appearance or the, how, the, how they came uh, freed on the prisoner, uh, in the prison. However, Gamaliel recognized there's something special in this one. They're the same people who were imprisoned and they mysteriously get out. There's something on this. But he, he recognized, you know, stop. Let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's think about this first. Two failed rebellions, if this is not for God, they will fail. Just imagine. Second, if you persecute them, guys, if you kill them, they will solidify what they're talking about, right? If they kill the leaders, the apostles and the followers will continue like, see, the, the more they persecute the people, the, you know, the, the movement will grow more because the, the, the Pharisees will, or the Sadduc uh, Sadducees will prove what the word of the Lord is saying. Because when we go back to the, to the gospel of, of Jesus, to the four gospels, we can see Jesus already said this one, that when he left the earth, you guys will receive persecution, that you will understand or you will, you will recognize, you will be recognized by the people on the convictions that you will stand. So, so Gamaliel said, stop for a moment. Think about this. And I think this is the, the greatest thing that Gamaliel said. He's concerned about the divine retribution. The divine retribution. He is concerned that maybe this thing, because it is growing by numbers, you know, from 3,000 to 5,000, and maybe there's a couple of thousands now. You know, they see on why do people believe in a person like Jesus. So he's saying, stop it. If this is for man, it will fail. Even though they can do everything they can, just give them time, they will fail. But if it's for God, anything that we, we will do will fail because we are against the one who created the world. Just imagine, it is very scary to find yourself opposing the one who created you. Just imagine the pride that it needs for you to stand against what the Lord is doing on this world. And as I analyze this particular verse, there is a compar there's a similarities and comparison or differences between the leaders and Jesus. We can see that all of them claim to be somebody. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, the Savior. And those people also claim that they are the Savior. All of them have followers. Maybe a couple of thousands. Here is 400 for, us, for one of these people. But Jesus' followers is, you know, growing. Also, all of them were killed. You know, Jesus were accused of, of, you know, of something that he didn't do. You know, he was committing blasphemy. That's the, that's the case that was given by the Sadducees and the other religious leaders. Well, the other people said, you know, those are the people that, that openly rebel against the Roman Empire. And also, all of their followers were dispersed after leaders dead. You can see in the book of Acts, like we said earlier, Jesus mandate the disciples to go. Don't just stay in Jerusalem. 
you have Samaria. You, there's a lot of people on the other parts of the world that needs the gospel. The reason why you're sitting here is because there's some people or a group of people who shared the word of the Lord to you and you receive it. But the difference is this. Those two people, Theudas and Judas, perish and was removed in history. But Jesus rose up. He proved that he is the Messiah, that he is indeed the reason son of God. The second thing is this. Those people, they just want to provide a temporary freedom. Just freedom from the Roman Empire. And what the Lord is giving you today, Jesus is providing you a more beneficial freedom that you can get. Freedom from sin. Freedom from the yoke of this world. And Jesus saved his people. And the Lord is giving us today the freedom. If you believe on him, you can get the eternal life that he is offering. Trust on Jesus and repent of our sins. And how many times in history that a lot of people or a group of people wants to destroy or stop Christianity. And yet, the message of Jesus continues to go on. We can see the Roman Empire rise and fall, yet the message of Christ is here. You can see some of, uh, some of, the, religious, some of the religion of this world try to eradicate, try to contain the word of God in a single box, but yet they're not failed. Some of the examples is the underground churches. They cannot stop it. They cannot stop it. And there was a French philosopher. His name is Voltaire. This is very funny because uh, he criticized Christianity. He mentioned a hundred years from now, the Bible will be a museum piece. He said that the Bible that we are holding now at that time, he said, it's going to be removed in history. It's going to be gone. And after his dad, do you know what happened? The house, his house, became a publishing house of the Bible. <laughs> that's it. And that's how the Lord moves. You know, he's trying to go against God, saying that the Bible will be eradicated. But the Lord moves and proves to him and say, nope, the same house where you said that the Bible will be eradicated, let me transform it. Let me make it a Bible publishing establishment. And that proves to us that the Lord continues to move in our lives. Which reminds me of, if a, of a good psalm. Psalm chapter 27, verse 1. Unless the Lord build the house, its builder labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. The thing that we're doing is for the Lord. And the Lord will continue to sustain us. The Lord will continue to empower us because we have the mission. Which leads us to our third point. Rejoice while sharing the word because it is an honor. It's an honor to be an ambassador of Christ. Amen? Amen. We can read this one in verse 40. So they took his advice and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. Do you think they will follow it? No. They let them go, and they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Observe some of the few observations here is this. Before, they want to kill the apostles, but they were persuaded on the argument of Gamaliel. So what they did, they lessened the punishment. Instead of killing them, they just beat them. You know, flew maybe a few slashes, maybe. You know, maybe, uh, maybe just, uh, I don't know, maybe they punched them or other stuff. But they want them to feel that what they're doing is wrong. But look at the attention. Look at the result on the life of the disciples. They left the presence of the council rejoicing. Rejoicing. Just imagine. You receive the slashes, 
someone punch you, maybe punish you, and then re rejoice, that is not natural for us, right? You know, we just hear something bad about us, like, oh, man, I, I feel bad now, and those kind of stuff. You know, but at that time, we can see that the disciples felt that this is part of being a Christian, that persecution is part of being a Christian. The attitude they have is rejoice. This is not a fake smiling, but they feel, they know that what they're doing is giving a smile in heaven. That God is happy in what they're doing. Look at this. They're counted worthy to suffer dishonor by the name. Dishonor means no worth. Means maltreatment. Dishonor means persecution. Insult. No value. As a Christians, can we say to ourselves, I am ready to be persecuted? Because that's what happened to the disciples. They rejoiced on that. However, they did not stop on preaching the word of God. They continue. They know that being in prison will not stop us because the Lord will provide. The Lord will sustain us. The fear doesn't matter. The Lord gave us the boldness that we need. And let me ask you, church, do you think, I want you to answer this one with either yes or no, do you think that the gospel of God can be stopped by fear or persecution? Yes or no? No. Do you think that what the Lord is doing at Brixo Baptist Church can be hindered by fear or anything that the people would say to us? Yes or no? No. Do you think that our community needs Jesus Christ? Yes. So what stops us? What stops you? What stops you from sharing the word of God to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family members? I understand that, the fear. Personally for me, I went here in the United States fearing that maybe the accent that I have will hinder me to share the gospel. Maybe some of the people will say, hey, I cannot understand you. That's the fear that I had. But I recognize that the Lord will move, that the Lord will continue with his mission. And you can see that I'm preaching here now. <laughs> it's just amazing what the Lord is doing, that he's going to provide. It, it takes time for me. I need to learn some stuff. However, the Lord gave the means for me to share the word more effectively. And for us here, share the word, share the word. And do you know, persecution comes in different forms, I would say. Outside of the United States, you know, we partner with some of, the, some, of the, some of the churches outside of the United States where Christianity is, you know, prohibited. You know, it's, a, it's literally people killing the missionaries that we have, right? And we need to pray for them. Their faith is so strong that they could die for that. Someone said, the church is built on the bloods of the martyrs, and which is so good. But for us, personally, for us, we are blessed that we are here in the United States of America, where freedom is being held high. However, we still have persecutions here. Maybe a family member is mocking you for your faith. You still go to that particular old-fashioned church. You know, that's it, right? People telling us that Following God is not worth it. You know, you're sacrificing your life because of that Jesus. You know, many people would say, what happened to, you know, tell me what's going on. Our family member died and your God did not heal him. Where's Jesus? Those simple comments, right? We can see that people want to silence us and what we believe. Those tiny persecutions that we have, right? We, we are not in other parts of the world. You know, we are not martyrs. But do you know what the Lord is telling us to us? Those people can die for his name, but God is saying, you can live for my name. Can we do it, church? And, and if you're looking for an encouragement to this one, the Apostle Paul, the same student of Gamaliel, 
the, this, the funny thing is this. Gamaliel said, hey, take it easy to this particular apostle, these apostles. Take it easy to them. And one of his students, apostle, <laughs> apostle Paul said, nope, nope, I'm going to kill them. You know? And he finds himself against God on the road to Damascus, right? Remember that story? He wants to kill those people while his teacher said, take it easy. And he said, I'm going to kill them. I'm going to persecute the church. And God proved that he's true, that no opposition can stand or hinder the word. God converts him. He made him the, the vessel. He made him the spokesperson of the message that he wants to stop. Just imagine the life that you have today. Before you became a Christian, we're the same people. We hate the gospel. We don't like this because it is against our selfish desires. But the Lord opens our hearts. The Lord opens our minds and say, this is who, who I am. You have a better life than me. And we accept him. And now that we're going to share it, let me give you an encouragement. Romans chapter 8, verse 31, 35. It is said, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can stand against us? If God is for us, who can stand against us? He did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. He will not also with him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect, his bride, his church, his people? It is God who justifies. It is who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God? Who is indeed interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, the apostle said, Shall tribulation could separate us from the love of God? No. Do distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, swords? Those are the questions that Apostle said is saying. Can those things separate you? And the question is no. 37, no. In all these things, we are more conquerors, more than conquerors through him who loves us. Those words should be an encouragement for all of us here to share the word of God. If we need a reminder, go to this verse that God's word will continue to usher in, that will continue to empower us on our word. We need to be optimistic on our evangelism. And how can we apply this one now in our lives? That is the question, right? First, we need to recognize that the persecution will always be part of our Christian life. It will always be part of our Christian life. Second, we need to trust God's providential care in the middle of persecution. If God saves you, God will sustain you. Amen? Third, we need to stand firm to our conviction when we are pressured between obeying God or man or this world. Fourth, be comforted in that God's word will not fail in spite of opposition. And lastly is this, we need to rejoice in the middle of persecution because it is honor to suffer for Christ. And let me close this one in a story. Earlier we sang a song called Christ is Enough. And that particular song used a, a bridge. And the bridge was, I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back, no turning back. And that particular words were uttered by a martyr in India for a couple of years ago. During, I think, 16th century or 7th century, I believe, this particular, there was a missionary, there's a revival in Europe where they sent missionaries throughout different parts of the world. And a group of missionaries came to India knowing at that particular time, you know, Christianity is not welcome to all parts of the world. When they go to this particular tiny town, they were rejected. The message was rejected. They don't believe it. However, there was a, a family, 
a husband and a wife and a two kids, and they were the first convert of this faith. Their faith is so effective that the Lord moved and God used them to convert the people in their town, slowly by slowly, you know. And the tribal chief saw what's going on because it changes the dynamic of the community. And he called this particular guy and said, who is, the, who is this person who's changing the whole dynamic? Who, who became the first Christian here? Because he wants to stop it. The guy moved forward and said, I am. And he said, you need to recant. You need to say, you need to deny your Jesus or else I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your family. And he said, no, I have decided to follow Jesus. And the tribal chief said, okay, that's your choice. And he ordered two of his archers to kill the kids first. At that time, if you're in this position, maybe you're changing your mind, right? That's my kids. That's my kids. And now the tribal chief said, now, are you going to deny your faith? Because the next person is your wife. He said, no, no. I'm going to continue with my faith. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And they killed the wife. And now him, the final person, he said, are you going to deny your faith? I'm going to give you the last chance. Maybe you want to live. And he said, no. No, the world before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. And the words of that particular person echoed in a hymn it was adapted by the song that we are going to sing and that particular thing touched the heart of the tribal chief months after that and he said what is the reason why this particular family died for this faith and he was convinced by the, the testimony of those people and said that christ jesus is true and the, the whole community was converted years after that it takes one person takes one person to be firm that they're going to obey God than what the other people are saying. If God can change Apostle Paul, he can change the people that you love. If I was saved, people, God can be saved. My parents had a testimony of this. They were against on that one, but the Lord changed us. If you have something or someone in your mind today who needs Jesus, tell them this particular facts. With these particular truths. Tell them who God is, that God is holy, that God loves them, that because of our sin, we are separated from Him, that we deserve the judgment of God, but God sent Jesus, that God sent Jesus, and we need to respond on the offering that God is giving us today. I want to encourage everyone to us to stand up. I want to appeal to all of you. The world needs Christ, church. Our community needs Christ. And if we are obeying God, we need to follow what God is saying. And we are blessed that we are called ambassadors of Christ. Let's preach the gospel of Christ and use this time to deal with God today. How's your Christian life right now? Is there anything that the Lord is telling you today? Maybe is this your first time in saying, Jonathan, there's something stopping me to believe in Christ. But now I understand that it took courage, it took boldness to, to go and follow God. Will you pray for me? If you, need, if you see the need to come to the altar, feel free to come here. Or maybe you want to stand on your seats just stay there and deal with the Lord. And let's, let's sing this particular song.